First up is the Helm of Baldurin and the Baldurin Giant Slayer. Within Worm's Rock Prison lies a secret door marked by two dragon head torches. The only way to get this secret door to appear is by attacking both these torches with an attack that deals lightning damage. Once both are attacked by lightning, the dragon head torches will glow blue and the wall will evaporate showing the way forward. Beyond the hall leads to a room with four statues and four chambers, each with unique trials. The Chamber of Courage, a room where you must survive for four turns. The Chamber of Judgment, where you must determine what happens next in the story told by paintings. The Chamber of Insight, where you must slay one of three who would lead Baldur's Gate to ruin. And the Chamber of Strategy, where you must perform a checkmate in two turns. Now, if you fail any one of the trials in a non-lethal way, then the dead will rise to fight you, but you can still progress to the following room. In there, you'll find your reward, the Helm of Baldurin, directly across from where you enter the room, and you'll also find the corpse of a massive creature. If you loot its dead body, you'll find the Baldurin Giant Slayer, but also a big, big surprise. These two items are incredibly powerful. I highly recommend you get them. They're probably some of the best items in the entire game. And if you like that tip, don't forget to click that like button and subscribe for more Baldur's Gate 3 videos. Number two is the unsolvable puzzle. Hidden within Cazador's palace is a secret room opened by pressing a button in another room. This room has yet another hidden trapdoor covered by a treasure chest. Move the chest aside and there'll be a hatch that you can lockpick. Below that is yet another puzzle. There are marble plates on the floor and metal trunks scattered about. If you manage to solve that puzzle, then a door is going to open leading to yet another puzzle. But this one, nobody has actually solved yet. It's unsolvable. There are more marble plates in this room, but also a lever base and what appears to be a broken off lever. However, this puzzle might be unsolvable, not because it's difficult, but instead because it's bugged. The second lever base is actually called marble plate, along with both of the broken off levers. So this is clearly a mistake because the lever base is called a marble plate, even though it's the same model as the actual lever base right next to it. And even the levers are called marble plates. And what's really interesting, if you place a metal trunk on these supposed metal plates, they actually just disappear, just evaporate into thin air. So while this puzzle can't be solved as of this video's publishing because of bugs, you might want to create a save file here for when this gets fixed to see what's behind all these puzzles. Number three is unstable blood. If you give Araja Bloodra your blood in Act 2, she will offer you a mysterious potion when you return to her again in Baldur's Gate. If you drink this potion, you'll receive the unstable blood passive feature, which makes your blood become highly flammable and explode when in contact with fire. You can give the potion to anyone in your party, so this would go great on a melee character who might get hit in melee range and allow for creating a fire surface near your enemies. Even better, on a melee tiefling like Karlak with hellish resistance to cut that fire damage in half. Unstable Blood is also incredibly powerful because, like we discussed in the Secret Spell Interactions video, having a fire surface below you allows you to drop potions repeatedly because dropping and moving potions doesn't cost an action and the fire surface breaks them open causing the mist to heal you. So Unstable Blood, while it might not look super amazing at first glance, could be really really helpful for a melee fighter. Number 4 is Nyrulna, the legendary trident. This amazing trident can be found within the circus of the last days by playing spin the wheel with Akabi the Jin. However, if you simply spin the wheel, you'll actually never win. You'll need to pickpocket the genie ring from him in order to win. Once you do, you'll be teleported to a strange jungle filled with Cholt Alioramas. You can fight or sneak your way to the opposite end where you're going to find a locked chest. Now you need to either lockpick it or smash through it and you'll find Nyrulna inside. Now this amazing trident is perfect for a throwing barbarian with the tavern brawler feet. The trident returns to you after each throw, it grants increased movement speed and jump distance, and it illuminates six meters around you. What I think is actually particularly interesting about this trident is that it also does 3 to 12 thunder damage in a six meter blast around where it was thrown. Now this is actually pretty serious AoE damage, especially if you're throwing it more than once. So if you have a melee character, they could probably take a lot of friendly fire damage from this. So depending on on your setup, you might want to be aware about that AoE damage and try to go after mobs that are away from your other allies. Number five is the true hero of Baldur's Gate. This is a statue that grants one of your characters a permanent bless buff that gets applied after every long rest.
quest, so you can't lose it by dying. In order to get this buff, you'll need to head to the Circus of the Last Days and talk to Boney. One of the dialogue options is that you'd like a statue of yourself for your camp. Boney will tell you it costs 5,000 gold, and if you pay, then after each long rest, you'll now have Bless on your character, granting 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws. And you'll also have a sweet statue of your character in your camp called the True Hero of Baldur's Gate. Number six is Tharkiite Vigor. By reading the Tharkiite Codex and getting the curse placed on you, by reading it removed, you will gain 20 temporary hit points after each long rest. This is another permanent buff that you'll keep even if you die because it's restored on long rest. It's important to make sure the character you want to get this buff reads the Tharkiite Codex first because they will get the curse and subsequent buff and it can't be moved to any other character after that. Now in order to find the Tharkiite Codex, you'll need to ascend Ramazith's Tower by taking the portal in Sorcerer's Sundries. Once there, you'll see a curious set of furniture floating in glowing blue and you can actually jump down to them and reach the middle floor. You'll need to use Sea Invisibility or find the Elixir of Sea Invisibility on the outer ring of the tower to read the plaques which are invisible which detail which weave buttons do what. And it, you'll be looking for a weave button that says Vault. Now pressing the wrong weave button can lead to activating pretty difficult to kill arcane cannons so make sure you're pushing the right one. Pressing the Vault button teleports you there and you'll be looking for a door called Ramazith. Behind that door are three more doors and a puzzle. You'll need to pass through the right sequence of doors to find a lever that will open the door leading to the Tharkiite Codex. All of this is very much worth it. The 20 temporary hit points is very great, but also really great for number seven. And number seven is the Dance Macabre. Once you acquire the Tharkiite Codex, while it's in your inventory of the same character that has the Necromancy of Thay, you can read the Necromancy of Thay again and you'll be faced with a wisdom check. If you manage to pass it, you will learn the Dance Macabre spell. This spell is a level five necromancy spell that summons four ghouls to fight for you, previously six. However, if you're a necromancer subclass wizard, this spell is currently summoning five instead, which is pretty awesome. It's a very powerful spell that requires you to have gotten both the Necromancy of Thay in Act 1 and then the Tharkiite Codex in Act 3. So it's actually really quite rare if you didn't know about these two items beforehand. Coming in at number eight is the Mirror of Loss, which is found deep within the House of Grief. This mirror grants you one to three additional ability points if you succeed all the ability checks and choose the appropriate dialogue options. When interacting with this mirror, you'll have a number of dialogue options, an arcana or religion option to discover the purpose of the mirror, and another religion option to pray to the mirror. All of these roles are very difficult and will likely require you to quick save before you attempt them if you want to succeed. You'll have to pass both roles in order to gain the permanent buff. But once you pass both roles, you'll be given the option of a memory to sacrifice, giving you minus two to a given ability based on what memory you sacrifice. Then there is a chance that the mirror will grant you a memory of your choice, granting the corresponding ability points. The option to gain a memory doesn't always appear though. It actually took me sacrificing three memories to be given the option of gaining a memory. But don't worry, once you've gotten your bonus ability points, all the minus two ability point curses can be removed and you keep your bonus ability points permanently. So it's totally worth it. Finally, at number nine is the Sentient Amulet. This amulet is particularly interesting for monks, granting lesser key restoration once per long rest, restoring two key points, and also can cast Shatter. This amulet can only be found in Act 1 within the Grim Forge, inside a locked adamantine chest, and once acquired, a cursed monk offers a blessing if you bring this amulet to his daughter Shira, who is in a sarcophagus below the Open Hand Temple in Act 3. When you use the amulet's power, you need to succeed a wisdom saving throw to prevent becoming hysterical through a feature called High Spirits. Hysterical is the equivalent of Tasha's hideous laughter, but only lasting one turn. But if you bring this amulet to Shira, you're given the option to bear the curse yourself or reject the offer of taking the curse. If you choose to bear the curse, you're going to need to succeed two ability checks and you will be rewarded with the ability to cast Tasha's hideous laughter once per long rest. However, if you fail any of the rolls, you will lose one wisdom point per failure and it's permanent. So this is a pretty risky endeavor unless you choose the illithid option, which is much easier. If you reject the curse, then the amulet will become very rare and you will lose the high spirits feature, which is what required you to succeed a wisdom saving throw 
or become hysterical, so it's a pretty nice upgrade. Also, the key restoration is upgraded to restore key points up to their martial arts die value instead of just two, so that's a very nice upgrade as well. If you reject the curse, the monk will raise the dead to attack you, but they are very easily defeated, and if you're a monk, I think it makes a lot of sense to decline the curse and get that upgraded amulet. And those are nine things you might have missed in Act 3. Thanks for watching.